Are you good? So, thanks for joining us. Today we're going to talk about, we've got a couple of disconnects. The first one is in the title, and the second is the topic in the audience. It's, the title is, Despite Intervention, Fall Injuries in Elderly Didn't Decline. The, uh, I think the verb here, didn't, um, is an operational, maybe the most important. We're going to cover an article out of the New England Journal where they actually did a study where they expected to get a significant improvement in, um, in falls, and they didn't. But we've got a falls expert with us, Janice, and she'll join me in just a minute um, and talk about ah, some critical components uh, and some critical uh, comments about that New England uh, study. <clears throat> The second disconnect is the term elderly. If you look at our channel, there is a huge, uh, th there's a big proportion, way over half of our channel uh, viewers are 55 and older, uh, mostly a lot of male, as you see with most YouTube channels, and very athletic, younger baby boomers. And people tend to think about, well, fall injuries are really something for the elderly, right? Not so much for the younger athletic, baby boomers. Well, that's not correct either. If you start looking, I mean, yes, it is true that it's a big issue for elderly, and we'll talk about that. And that was really a major focus for, for this New England um, Journal article. But for the discussion for today, uh, we're going to talk a lot more about falls with, again, the younger, more athletic uh, baby boomer. Uh, Janice has got a... Um, a doctorate in physical therapy and a doctorate in health education. So falls have been right up her alley. She actually has some uh, significant falls programs and she'll share some of those with you in the, uh, in the program today. Before we get to the program, just some, uh, some quick uh, statements about other resources that we have available. Previous topics, heart disease in women, that was popular. Uh, mode RNA vaccine, you know, as with everything else in this country, Vaccines have become very politi politicized. You get two or three different warring components on vaccines. One is the anti-vaxxers and the vaxxers, and we had some anti-vaxxers join us for that meeting. Uh, the other is the, um, the folks that are concerned about COVID overall and not concerned and think it's made up. And you know that group, I think, is uh, decreasing as the second wave continues to uh, to plow through the U.S. Um, we had a, a discussion, a program recently about uh, repurposing old drugs like um, Medrol, you know, the uh, basic uh, steroids. Big, big deal. That, but that's not the only one. There are several others as well. Stem cells, a cure for diabetes. Uh, that was popular. But I think the, uh, the most popular... The two most popular recent ones were saturated fats, good or bad. Believe it or not, there was a big fat surprise for a whole lot of people in this one. Most people have been thinking for a long time, fats, especially saturated fats, are bad for you. Not so fast. And then the biggest item on this channel is 
has routinely been, can we actually reverse arterial plaque buildup? And the answer is yes. So a uh, couple of other uh, comments about different resources that are available. Uh, we've got webinars, we'll cover several, we'll mention several of them. We've got the insulin resistance inflammation webinar. The reason we put those two together is that they're both lab tests. We go through the full-blown OGTT and insulin uh, response, similar to a craft insulin survey for patients, which you can get through our system uh, at a local lab, a local Quest lab. While you're there getting blood drawn, you might want to check your uh, inflammation panel. And guess what? That's what these folks do. They, 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 we, they call us, we give them the lab orders so they know what to get. They call up um, Quest at their local si draw site. They get it done. And then we get together and talk about what your doctor doesn't know in terms of how to order this, how to interpret this, and what you need to know and don't know about uh, inflammation and it being caused by insulin resistance, diabetes. As you watch the, the, uh, the comments on this channel, you see multiple comments per each month where somebody says, hey, doc, I went and got those tests you recommended. I didn't have prediabetes. I had full blown diabetes and my doc's been telling me I'm okay. You know, we know that the primary care system, the doctors in the U.S. don't fully understand prediabetes at this point. They will, I'm sure, at some point. But um, are you feeling lucky and can you wait that long? Plaque webinar, speaking of feeling lucky, the typical way of, of finding out whether you have plaque is getting a stress test. If you just if you're next to a Google or if you're on your computer, you may want to just quickly Google uh, false positive, false negative rates for stress tests. Usually, the Google snippet that will come up will say, out of about six to eight million uh, stress tests done each year, we know that one and a half million are wrong, false positive and false negative. So. If you're relying on a stress test to decide whether or not you have risk for heart attack and stroke, you gotta be feeling lucky. Uh, speaking of, of that whole topic, what a stress test won't tell you, again, uh, the poster boy for that is uh, Tim Russert. Uh, Russert had a, had a negative stress test. They were worried about his heart attack risk. He went in to see his doc. He, they were relieved to find that his stress test was negative, uh, sent him back to work. A couple of months later, he died of a heart attack, and he's not unusual. Most of the subscribers, in fact, most of us know somebody who had a, had a negative stress test and died, or who had a positive stress test, had a stent, and what you don't know is that that was not going to be causing a heart attack. So uh, we've got a, the book. It's um, where we finally submitted the last uh, the last content, including the the images to the uh, publisher this past week. I don't know how long it's going to take the publisher to get it all wrapped up and out there, but we'll let you know for sure. Janice has been working with Michelle on getting the supplements webinar out there. Uh, we all know uh, you can't supplement your way out of a lifestyle problem, but we also all ought to know, and unfortunately, most of our docs don't, and that is there's true science, which shows results and very positive results from a lot of supplements out there. Jim Nema, the sugar destroyer, uh, bergamot, folate, uh, berberine, vitamin K2. And um, if you're one of those, doc if your doc is one of the docs that says, you know what, supplements just make expensive urine. You know what, I used to think that until I actually studied the science. So. Supplements are actually a very popular topic. We're going to be uh, making that available. You can call Michelle if you have an interest in it. Uh, you can also call Michelle if you're headed into um, uh, Medicare age over the next few years and you want to figure out a way to get good prevention. Uh, usually, um, again, that's hard to find. And folks are finding, you know, this is a great way to get set up within uh, prior to Medicare, going into Medicare, where I can actually get prevention uh, in addition to the regular medical care that I get. If you have any questions about uh, some of the content that I've covered, it's on the website. We know the website's been old and ugly and 
it's been what they call a brochure website for years. So over the past six months, we've started to do some things to, uh, to make it simpler, easier, and a little bit more attractive. So <clears throat> thank you for, uh, for listening to what we've got available. And Janice is going to join us and tell us a little bit about uh, falls. Then we're going to talk about that study that just came out in the New England Journal and what we think they could have done better. Okay, that looks pretty good. We had to get adjusted to make sure that you could see Janice. Janice, you want to tell us a little bit about your perspective on FALSE? I know it's a big deal for you, and I know you're actually doing some uh, FALSE programs with some of our patients. Correct. So if I had read the title of this uh, YouTube today, I probably wouldn't have participated because <laughs> that is a total misnomer for, of a title, despite intervention, fall injuries in elderly didn't decline. That's based on one article that did not use an evidence-based fall prevention program. But it was public, published, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is why Ford selected it. And that was their finding. However, I do want to point out that there is a Cochrane meta-analysis of 44 studies that has a quite quite different outcome. So a couple of comments real quick. Now, I, I knew that you would not like this study. I knew that you were aware of the study. Um, and that was the real reason was to give you a chance. I wanted to uh, get people some understanding about faults. This is not the first... Um, the first video we've done on falls. We did one about two years ago and I don't want to get political, but I'm going to mention a political candidate. You remember a couple of years ago, um, Hillary, Hillary Clinton had a big fall and her face got messed up. The, um, falls are a big deal. It doesn't matter what level of performance you're at. It doesn't matter what type of, uh, athletic performance you're at. As you and I were discussing earlier, you know, you typically, you often get those among athletic instructors. Correct. Um, just a little data, one out of four people over age 65 fall. For those of you who are not at that age yet, you may have already fallen, even if you have a very healthy lifestyle that includes exercise, or you know someone that has fallen. Last week, I knew four people that fell. Um, amongst people that I know that have fallen have been a fitness instructor, a teacher. You don't have to be unfit. Obviously, there are risk factors to falling, but falls happen in people that are still um, very involved in their own lifestyle routines. And be, the reason for that is there are extrinsic factors, which are things outside of us. As we age, we have more intrinsic factors, loss of vision, multiple medications. But the extrinsic factors can be the environment, um, you know, a dip in the sidewalk. It can be dual tasking, which is looking at your cell phone while you're walking. And these are real live examples that I know people that have fallen. Um, Environmental, um, environmental issues, trip hazards. And the classroom is a very good uh, place for that, for teachers. For trip hazards. Yeah, they have things at a low level if they're working with young children. You know, it's a very experiential, um, experiential environment. And that can cause tripping for the adult. Um, so... It's true, as we age, we have more and more risk factors, but even before we hit that 65 years, we are all capable of falling. Um, and the interesting thing about falls is, and I don't remember specifically with Hillary if she had a subdural or not. I thought, I don't know if she, something reminds me of that, but 
A lot of people will have a subdural hematoma in the brain with a fall and not know it, but that actually puts you at more risk for later cognitive decline. You know, even a car accident can call that where your brain gets shaken up a bit. When you were talking about people, um, high performers, you left out the marathon runner. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of your patients is a marathon runner that um, had a fall. Right. So I don't know if you wanted to cover this article, but I will say the research that I've read on evidence-based programs for fall prevention have seen the rate of falling decline by 25%. A program that I am currently piloting has a 40% decrease in falls. This is the evidence based on randomized controlled trials, et cetera. Um, but the single factor that is salient among these studies is that, and I wanna bring this up, this is a very strong point, that exercise alone means strengthening, um, resistive training, even flexibility is not enough. The key barrier to falling, the key intervention is balance. And yeah. the literature supports that in a fall prevention program, you need 50 hours of balance instruction to have that decrease in fall rate of 25 to 40%. 50 hours of balance instruction. Let's, let's tease that out for a second. But before we do, let's talk about what the, the dichotomy that we're seeing. You said, you know, you're, you've made it clear you're critical of this New England Journal article. I think one of the key differences here is that, again, you tend to be talking about uh, younger, healthier folks. They looked at an intervention where they basically just had nurses working with uh, uh, more the more elderly population. No, the the share the um, Cochrane review are for people that have already fallen and are in a fall prevention program. Okay, so let's talk about Cochrane for just a second for reminders for folks. People say, well, you know, the New England Journal is the best there is. Well, not exactly. Cochrane is really the best there is. And it was based Co on 44 studies with randomized control fall intervention. So do you mind if I finish? Go ahead. So Cochrane is, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Cochrane, it's the Cochrane Review Systems. Uh, they're actually associated with Wikipedia at this point. Um, yep. Cochrane Review Systems were uh, systems where they basically look at the state of the art. They look at all of the studies that are available in a certain scientific area. So, for example, um, people worry about metabolic acidosis with uh, metformin. And in fact, you'll see that on the, May the Mayo Clinic website. The reality is that's not true. You don't have risk there. And there have been not one, but two Cochrane reviews in that space. So the point you're making is similar here. There's a lot of perception that you can't do anything about falls. However, however, the people that do science reviews for a living, the reviews of the state of the art, the science that's been out there, all the clinical trials have actually reviewed this and they've said, yes, you can have an impact. So uh, maybe you needed to have a little bit different uh, uh, components of the uh, the literature review and the components of this article. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. You know, what I, you saw with Cochrane? Yeah, I, I think I've already stated it that they um, did see, again, these are people at risk for falling that are in fall intervention programs. Um, and they, and I already mentioned it was 44 studies that were randomized control studies that they reviewed and they saw a drop in the rate of falls of 25%. The single most factor was intervention, was balance. Balance as opposed to athletics. Yeah. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on studies. I'd like to get, you know, to some points that people can make a difference in their lives today as well. I will just well, say briefly, this study was just with nurses. It was via phone. No assessment, just the standard, um, you know, written protocol that they read to patients. Um, it was not evidence-based. It, it was not an implementation study. It was, it was an intervention study to see if this intervention worked, and it did not. Whereas yeah. the Cochrane Review used evidence-based fall prevention programs um, 
So on a practical basis, what they're saying is, look, uh, one of the easiest ways we can maybe access a whole lot of patients is nurses in your typical uh, primary care doctor's in office. That and they set up that kind of nurses making telephone calls out of your primary yeah. care doctor's office. And it didn't work. Yeah. And one of the things you said was 50 hours of balance training. Correct. That's what the, um, again, we keep referring back to Cochrane, but I'd like to hone in on the point that most um, fall prevention programs include multiple approaches. Like the one that I'm currently doing a pilot with is called the Otago, O-T-A-G-O. It's evidence-based. I would not implement a program that was not evidence-based. Um, I'm using it along with health coaching, and I'll describe why in a few minutes. But it's a it's a program that you spend the first two months meeting with the patient regularly. You evaluate. Again, that's a key point. You evaluate using, and I want to bring up this guideline that anyone can access online, the Center for Disease Control, CDC, on their website has something called STEADY, S-T-E-A-D-I, it's an acronym. But basically, <clears throat> it has information for patients and information for um, health practitioners. The program that I'm using uses the STEADY um, assessment to evaluate patients on a regular basis, you know, first initial and then um, I'm evaluating every two weeks. Um, but then the exercises are a combination of flexibility, resistive training, and again, number one, balance exercises. It's not a cookie cutter approach. It's individualized for the patient. There are, um, there are structured exercises, but then you, through the evaluation, you know the person's ability and what they can do and you change components of it to meet their needs. Um, the reason that I like pairing health coaching with it is I've already assessed the motivation and the health vision of the individual. And a key component of the program I'm using, the fall prevention program, is tracking. And in health coaching, we also do a lot of tracking, which is, you know, you can think about Fitbit, you know, all these ways, Apple Watch, that you can track exercise. But <clears throat> I already know someone's propensity to be data-driven. And um, the person I'm piloting, piloting it with, I know, is very good at keeping that data, which on the Otago translates to a daily exercise log. And the exercises are three times a week and then walking three days a week on alternate days um, than the exercise. So, so, so if I want to prevent falls myself, if I want to take this information and, and implement it, so the only way I can do it is get into a 50 hour training program and keep logs and all that stuff? I would start on the CDC website. There is a list of risk factors and that is a screen. I would start with a risk uh, factor screen. And some of those items I've mentioned are um, polypharmacy. Taking, What's that mean? Taking more than one med. And um, there's data on how each, each added medicine increases the risk for fall. And I don't have that right in front of me. So can I? Polypharmacy, vision changes, gait um, changes, walking, gait changes. Go ahead. So if, if I could interject just a second. Uh, and go back in terms of my own personal experience as a medical director. Um, you know, I did some work with the uh, with um, Medicare Advantage, mm -hmm. and they assign risk that they know from seeing, you know, from paying for health care for patients. One of the items that clearly creates a significant cost to Medicare is people taking sleeping pills. Right. Because they'll it, relatively they'll young or or older, you take the sleeping pill, you go to bed, you wake up in the middle of the night to go pee, and you fall. Right, and most people 
have something they can modify to help with that, and that is lighting. Yeah. So environment is environment environment and footwear are other risk factors. Rug. Yeah, for falls. So there's a lot on that website that is available to anyone if you deem that you are in a high risk category that's when one of these evidence-based fall intervention programs is important but there's things you can do daily such as work on your balance so that you don't get to a point where you experience a fall and how do you do that so can i share interject and share on that or go ahead you, you talk about your part and then we'll give me an example okay so what I do with a lot of our patients, I do this as a health coach, is I do have them practice balance, which you can do when you're dressing, standing on one foot to put on pants. Uh, when you brush your teeth, same thing, standing on one foot. Uh, <clears throat> static balance is where you're standing and you're not moving. Dynamic balance is when you're moving. So if you're standing on one foot and you reach overhead with your arm, you're challenging your balance even more. So there's ways to um, <clears throat> adopt balance training in a very functional way. Now Ford is doing it within his resistive training. I challenged him to start working on his balance while he does all his resistive training because he wasn't doing any balance exercises. So, but that, this is more of an extreme example for most people out there. I would say, you know, find functional ways to work on balance. Sidestepping is another good way. Um, even if you look at the assessment, as I mentioned on the CDC, you'll see different foot placements that challenge your balance before, besides standing on one foot. Another one is standing in tandem with one foot in front of the other heel to toe. And, you know, you could stand at the sink and brush your teeth that way, too, in that stance. So he took it more to applying it to get it over while he's doing his resistive exercise. But that's not something I typically. Well, I mean, back in my 40s and 50s, I was playing. A lot of, I was playing a lot of basketball and um, you were with me there when I was getting undressed for my colonoscopy and you. Mm. Got frustrated with me about doing that balance thing. Yeah, he was, he was under anesthesia <laughs> and he tried to stand on one foot to get dressed. And then he was like the leaning tower of Pisa on me. And I said, sit down. I said, sit down. <laughs> and I pushed him to the bed. <laughs> yeah, you did. You took matters in your own hands. And the nurse totally agreed with me that he should not be standing on one foot. But you were doing that training at the time. It, it was because I was doing that active training that you're describing. Yeah. Yeah. For basketball reasons. And yeah. then I gave it up. I wasn't doing that. I got focused on just resistance training and uh, high intensity intervals. And you pointed out just uh, a few weeks ago that, look, what are you doing in terms of balance? And so um, I had some things I went back and started doing again. Right. But it's good. Like, again, to me, the key thing is to do it functionally. It's also to be aware of when you're dual tasking, which is doing more than one thing at the same time. Like I mentioned, I know someone that fell looking at their cell phone and um, you know, the sidewalk's uneven, you're not aware of changes in the surface. When I walk and my phone rings, I don't answer it. Um, and I just had to make that decision because I too did not want to fall. Like I'm eliminating that risk factor, that environmental risk factor for myself. When I, and I walk a lot. I walk 10,000 steps a day. So usually my phone is always ringing a couple times while I'm out. But I've made that decision based on my knowledge, you know, of this person's fall. So it's kind of, it's thinking about what you're doing and the environment you're in and even your own home environment. What can you change? Uh, we had a guest shortly after we moved into this house and they said, unlike your other house, there's no nightlights. And I said, you know, we haven't gotten them up yet. And then I think Ford and I both went on Amazon and separately bought them. And now we have like probably one every 10 feet in this house. And that's a very easy strategy to implement. Another strategy is most people don't use the stair rail until they have to in terms of physical ability. And there's 
and again, I've had people fall carrying, carrying something with both hands and going up the stairs. Again, your balance is, you know, changed with the object you're carrying. But I personally have used a rail ever since I was pregnant and we had a kind of a circular staircase um, in that particular house. And you just have to make, you have to come up with a conclusion, I might have to make two trips. And I have had patients that have done that and are a lot safer. I do wanna add, uh, cause I have to leave shortly, that there's a major risk factor that we're not mentioning. And that is the fear of falling. It's an emotional response. People have it that have fallen already. Absolutely, you can understand why. But there's also people, and I'm one of these, I'm age 63, I know what the outcome can be of a fall. And even though hip fractures are not as um, frequent as you might imagine with a fall, it is a major setback. It's like um, 20 to 30% of people with hip fractures don't have a good recovery. And so the that's the way a lot of old people die. So instead of having the fear of falling that can increase your risk, you have to deal with it and make some changes. Like I said, don't multitask, don't use your cell phone, hold the rail. I don't have the fear of falling because I've made some, I've implemented some personal strategies. And I'll leave it with that if you're okay. Okay, I was going to see if you had a chance, had time for a couple of questions. Yeah, but. I'll take a couple. Okay, so why don't uh, why don't we go into questions? Um, Aspen, if you would, let's just skip over to the the water ball and the questions. Can you do that? Hey, be careful. You might think you're never going to fall, but we all know someone who has, don't we? Next time, it could be you. The good news is most falls are preventable. Start with six easy steps. First, find a balance or exercise program to help you build stability, strength, and flexibility. Make it fun and go with a friend. Don't be afraid to tell your doctor if you've had a fall or are afraid of falling. Ask her to assess your risk of falling. Discuss medications with your pharmacist or doctor. They'll know what prescriptions and over-the-counter medications can increase your risk of falling. Make sure you get your vision and hearing checked every year because your eyes and ears are key to keeping you on your feet. Keep your home safe. For example, remove any items you might trip over. Make sure your home is well lit. Use bath mats in your shower and install grab bars in the bathroom. And finally, remember, it's important to talk to your family. Ask for their support in taking these simple steps to stay safe. Falls are not a normal part of aging, but every 13 seconds, an older adult visits an emergency room for a fall-related injury. Luckily, you can take steps to reduce your risk visit ncoa.org backslash falls prevention to learn more. I see a lot of good things in the chat room, but I do want to make a remark that that the National Council on Aging is another good resource. Uh, they have a falls link, just like the CDC, um, are both good um, patient education, adult education sites. Can I, can I yeah, mention a couple of questions here? Yeah. So my website is the PrevMed um, website. I'm listed on there. With my credentials, I have not advertised the fall prevention program yet that I'm piloting. Uh, but if you want to see me, you'll find me via that website or call um, Michelle. Um, now somebody. You see that? Oh. Yes. A lot of you are mentioning some really good ideas of things to look out for throw rugs, extension cords. 
ice ladders. I say stay off of ladders. Ford wears a bicycle helmet to get up on a ladder for that item we talked about, subdural hematoma. A lot of people think that's really geeky, but you know what? I'm not going to uh, be dead with a brain injury from falling off of a ladder. And my, I know people that are. are. Yeah. At a certain age, my recommendation, or depending on your ability, I, I would just get off the ladder and hire someone to do your gutters, et cetera. I like, somebody wrote three cats, and <laughs> I, I, it's true, there is research showing cats that people that. trip over their pets. And even though I have a 14 pound dog, she tends to stand around my things. ankles yeah. and I trip over her and people get pulled by their pet when they go on a walk. Um, and so a no pull harness is another item that can help. This is Joe Riley. I don't know if you remember Joe. Yeah, I do. Yeah, so uh, he, he uses ZV1. Now, I'm not sure what he's talking about. I think maybe he's saying, uh, could, Continue you, a live class could we have a, uh, a live class? And when that is definitely a possibility. And Joe's got three cats. Oh, that was Joe. Okay. Be careful with those cats. Dizziness is another major contributor. I agree. Um, orthostatic hypotension is when your blood pressure drops when you get up. So for a lot of us, I do this myself. I do not jump out of the bed. First of all, I'm not a jump out of the bed person but it's good to sit on the edge of the bed. I had I have a patient that fell getting up from the bed. And so it's good to sit on the edge of the bed, pump your ankles a little bit, get the blood flowing. Again, it's when your <clears throat> blood pressure drops when you go from laying down to standing. You are in commercial? Vertigo, that's another, there is physical therapy specifically for vertigo issues. Um, I, again, have another acquaintance that, two acquaintances that have been di um, diagnosed with that recently, and that has, there are specific recommendations. You, I would say go to a physical therapist that specializes in vertigo. Yeah, that's a big, big deal. You know, I used to be the medical director for Toyota and several other organizations like that, and when people get uh, vertigo and you know, you can't climb anymore. There's a lot of stuff you can't do. Can't work with machinery. Well, it's even dangerous to drive a car if you have it. Thank you, Janice. We'll, we'll get back. I'll go back and do another uh, another run through some of these true moves. Uh, thoughts on linoleic acid as a cause of. There's actually, that, I don't know them will be that much. There's that orthostatic blood pressure issue. If you go to that CDC website, they tell you how to measure it. Basically, you can measure your blood pressure laying down and then make, measure your blood pressure getting up. And if you're dizzy, sit on the side of the bed and measure it first before you go to standing. I but, think, but there's a nice hand or, you know, there's a nice um, paper on it on that CDC website. I think uh, sax boy horn, horn or sax girl horn boy uh, was the person that gave us some good input regarding the differences. Not all uh, extended release metformin is the same. That was very helpful information. I don't see any other falls related comments or questions, Janice. Okay. Well, thank you. I will head out and Ford can take it from here. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to run back through some of these that were um, not falls related. And the first one was a, a $10 uh, super chat. Joe Riley. Thank you again, Joe. It looks like your O2 sat's doing well and um, your pulse is up there at 76. Oh, wait a minute. Didn't see this one, Joe. If you fall and are unconscious and wearing an Apple Watch, it will call emergency services for you. Very interesting. You know, the I still don't own one. I've been that close several times to getting a uh, an Apple Watch. You, those of you who uh, know about, sorry, those of you who know about atrial fib, um, you're in the minority. There's probably at least 10 people that it's, it's similar to, similar to the situation with prediabetes. There's probably at least 10 people that have atrial fib 
fibrillation that don't know it for every person who does know it. And uh, if you have an interest in that space, I have it. Um, again, you can be relatively young, relatively healthy, relatively um, uh, athletic and still have, uh, have atrial fib. The reason that it's important to know, it, one, one point about it, why is it difficult? Uh, you may not have any symptoms. You may have symptoms once or twice a month. And that was the case for me. And I had that going on for a couple of years, kept watching it. I finally discovered mine with um, a thing called iCardia. Now there's a lot of competitors on Amazon. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, where in the heck is he going? And what has this got to do with, um, with falls? Here's what it's got to do with that. There is now a, an Apple Watch that is the cardio version, and it is great for picking up atrial fib, atrial fibrillation that you didn't know that you have. Why do you want to know if, if you've got atrial fib? Well, it multiplies your risk for stroke by about five, five to seven times. So you need to know, is there something you can do about it? Yes, there is something you can do about it. Uh, so yes, uh, that's where that was all going. Thank you, Joe, for sharing that. Um, uh, blood sugar, you know, James brings up a good point. Um, at doctor, the blood sugar is 115, hemoglobin A1C was 5.7. I think, uh, James, you've shared, I think you've shared before that you've uh, got full blown or frank or complete diabetes. And actually, those numbers are not too bad for somebody who's got significant diabetes, um, especially that A1C. I know. I know and see a whole lot of people whose doctor never knew that they had a problem and yet their hemoglobin A1C was up around five, uh, the high fives like that. Um, in fact, mine got up to like five, six, five, seven at one point. Um, so those are some numbers to be thinking about. Most docs will not react at all until it gets to six or even six and a half. And that's way too late. You're already burning your arteries before uh, before you get to six. Uh, Joe, I would like to start an online five dollar. Uh, Joe, I'm not sure what you're talking uh, what you're talking about. Uh, online five dollar uh, falls course. I'm not sure. Um, so we covered that. James had a couple of questions about how to access Janice's content, and I think she covered that with you. Recats, Jill England, you mentioned mild diffuse cerebral and cerebellar volume loss. What can I do? So, um, Jill, the, one of the first things I would recommend when you, let me just step back and make a comment. I had a patient say this to me just yesterday. She said, Doc, this may sound silly, but it's just my concern. And that is, I'm actually, I think I'd rather have a heart attack than dementia. And uh, she's got, she's got APOE4 and she knows she's got some risk there. She's got some uh, inflammatory drivers, uh, but she's got, she's got some great glucose numbers. Um, but my response to her was this. Oh gosh, no, that's not weird at all. In fact, after patients begin working with us, Usually within six to 18 months, I'll hear, hear them say the same thing. You know what, Doc, when I first came to you, I was concerned about heart attack. To me, that sounded like the worst thing. Now that I'm getting my head wrapped around that, I understand my risks. I understand that I can actually prevent my heart attack. I'm not even so concerned about that anymore. What I want to do is make sure that I have that I'm not disabled. Um, stroke is the number one cause of permanent disability and it's gonna be uh, replaced soon by dementia, Alzheimer's. It's already a major cause of disability. So uh, brain related issues are huge issues. Thank you so much, Jill, for bringing them up. Um, what I would uh, suggest you do, if you haven't read the book, um, um, 
here I'm <laughs> having a senior moment. The End of Alzheimer's by D Dale Bredesen. Very, very good book. He works in a lab, lab that uh, worked in a lab that received a Nobel Prize for working with Alzheimer's. But let me clarify something here that Jill's talking about. She's saying cerebral and cerebellar volume loss. Uh, cerebral, yes, cerebellar volume loss is, is the cerebellum is the lower back part of the brain, which is very much associated with movements. As you see, as I start doing this, I'm, my head's moving one way and my hands are both coordinated together. The cerebellum is key to coordinated body movements like that. And that is a big deal for the topic for today, prevention of falls. Cerebral uh, volume is a big deal for uh, cognition. So both of these are very important points. Brain health is critical. Um, we're getting to where we can start managing and preventing heart attack and stroke risk. Now we need to start making sure that, I believe it was Abraham Lincoln that, that said this, believe it or not, it's not so many uh, years you have in your life. It's the life you have in your years. So again, uh, we have a program focused on brain health. Uh, it's based on uh, Dale Bredesen's program. We've actually been a provider for uh, Dale Bredesen's program for a couple of years. So. Um, I don't know how much more detail I can get into on that, on that topic, but thank you, Jill, for bringing it up. Sax Girl Horn Boy, thank you so much. Uh, another um, super chat, $5 super chat. I hope the, uh, uh, just for the, for the rest of you, I mean, it may sound like a, an old Jerry, uh, I'm blanking on somebody, uh, help me out. Jerry, uh, who was the comedian that appeared on a lot of those um, telephone-a-thines uh, collecting for, um, was it cerebral palsy? Uh, this, you know, to me, uh, I, somebody told me once that uh, I reminded them of Jerry Lewis. I could be kind of goofy. I never thought that, but bottom line is, I've got a cause here too, and it's helping people be healthy into their, um, into their baby boomer years. The number one cause of death is heart attack. This is preventable. The number one cause of disability, stroke, also preventable. Number one cause of blindness, diabetes, totally manageable. And that, uh, that blindness is preventable. Total uh, number one cause of kidney disease, again, diabetes, again, kidney disease is, pre kidney disease is preventable. So, Yes, we will take uh, uh, these these donations. They make a big deal. A lot of a large portion of our staff is from the Philippines. The finances, the economics are totally different. Five dollars makes a big, big difference in terms of uh, managing our programs. Basically, I, I supplement and uh, support the vast majority of the channel. I work for it for free, which is by far the biggest economic value, but we also contribute some of our uh, retirement. Janice gets nervous about that. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you so much, Sax Girl Horn Boy. Uh, we've, we've had another one as well. Uh, Bill Clifford, super sticker. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And you're right, Jerry, uh, uh, Joe, it was Jerry Lewis. Lewis, correct. Thank you so much. Okay, next level sports medicine. Thanks, Ford. I really enjoy this platform and your expertise. I would love to talk further to provide these services here in Franklin, Tennessee. Be safe and be well, my friend. Very interesting. Um, we haven't met, I don't know if you know, up and we've lived in Franklin, tw Tennessee twice in our life. And when we started this clinic, it was in Franklin. It was. Um, uh, right down near the Cool Springs uh, Galleria. Oh, Joe's reminding us, please, uh, please do a thumbs up. Please do a like. And the more of these that we have, the more reactions we get like this, the more comments, the more you share, especially when you share this stuff on social media. 
the al the YouTube algorithm reads it and they sit and it says, you know what, human beings are watching this. They think this content is important and worthwhile. Uh, they've shared it. I'll share it too. So thank you so much, Joe. Thank you for. Um, Hold on just a minute. I think I skipped over this comment. Carlston Nielsen, dementia and Alzheimer's may be due to less physical engagement and training of body in order to keep brain and body intact and functional. Not sure that I understand exactly what you're saying. A whole, you know, there are a ton of people that have a ton of theories about how, um, how, um, what causes dementia and Alzheimer's? Uh, physical activity is a huge deal. Now, um, actual loss of, or decreased uh, physical activity, physical engagement, physical training, major components in terms of risk factors for development of Alzheimer's. So again, thank you so much for your interest today and um, please share.